This is Solid Snake, and you're listening to This Week in Geek with Mike the Birdman and the rest of the Twig crew on thisweekingeek.net. How disrupts my coronation! Everyone has been destroyed because of this freak! I won't allow it! These babies just saved this lame fest party! What's going on? You are listening to ThisWeekInGeek.net. I'm your host, Mike the Birdman, and well, it is time to talk about role-playing games, and I'm sort of resurrecting yet again, much like trying to get your friends together to play an RPG. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't, but today... I got something really cool. Let's just say I went down to my local game store and got something awesome. Uh, We're going to be doing an interview today, guys. So a couple of years ago, back when the pandemic started, I talked with a lot of people in the industry. And now that I'm involved in in the industry, I'm a freelance writer for the company that that does Star Trek Adventures. um, I decided I want to start talking with more people that are in this creative space, be it designers, writers, artists, whoever, anything to expand my knowledge. And it's something that I think is worth sharing with you, the listeners, because you'll get kind of an insight on what goes into making some of these games. And today I got something really special. This interview has been in the works for probably a couple of months now, just due to everything that's happened uh, this summer. If you've been following my like personal life, you know, it's been a it has certainly been a trek. Um, so I was in contact with the guys over at Evil Genius Games. Now, this is a company that has really made a splash recently by by making a game that's sort of the evolution of D20 Modern. And this is a game they have called Everyday Heroes. And you might be thinking, okay, well, it's an update to D20 Modern. What makes that so special? Well, outside of bringing the idea of the D&D type rules to modern day, What these guys have done is something really exceptional, and if you've been a fan of my previous RPG work with with, uh, Terrible Warriors, I love licensed uh, IP, be it Star Wars, Star Trek, um, anything based on a video game or a movie, that is my jam. I'm known as the crossover guy. So I asked them over at Evil Genius Games, well... Who could you set me up with? And they set me up with a gentleman who's known as Siegfried Trent. This is one of the guys who worked on Everyday Heroes, and then he worked on some other very cool things that work with Everyday Heroes, and that is the source books that work with this game, such as based on the John Carpenter movie Escape from New York... Didn't know you could license that into an RPG, so we've got some questions. And then also one of my all-time favorite movies, Highlander, which I've unsuccessfully worked into the world of darkness, for better or for worse. Um, So yeah, and he also worked on Kong Skull Island and many other games in this line. So without any further ado, Siegfried, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Uh, Yeah. yeah. Hi, everybody. (laughs) So I'm Siegfried Tread. I'm the lead designer at Evil Genius Games, and uh, I'm excited to be here and happy to talk about anything and everything in game design and everyday heroes. Yeah, it is exciting to talk to a game designer because, like, it turns out I played D20 Modern way back in the early 2000s to, well, frankly, utterly disastrous results. Uh, just because at the time, a lot of people in my in my group of friends didn't understand third edition D and D. And when you change the coat of paint on it to run with modern sensibilities, it worked for me, but didn't work for them. So having everyday heroes be based uh, around the fifth edition of Dungeons and Dungeons and Dragons, which is probably one of the most accessible RPG systems currently around. 
I think you guys have done something really elegant, and you're not the first company to do this. Like, I know uh, Wyvern Gaming did Stargate last year, but the fact that you've been able to adapt this flexible rule set to everything from like dystopian apocalyptic future to high fantasy uh dueling with a like highlander to even total recall which i'll be honest with you never would have thought would be adaptable outside of like maybe someone doing a like kind of one-off thing so i guess let's kind of talk about your career how did you start in the tabletop rpg industry where does your life begin with those little funny shaped dice well, let's see. Uh, I started gaming when I was uh, probably around 12 or so. My parents sent me one of those D&D Redbox games, or my grandparents sent it to me as a gift, and I thought it was wonderful. I had no idea what you do with it, right? But I had all these great pictures of warriors and wizards and things, and I thought that was wonderful since I, I grew up being read uh, Lord of the Rings as a bedtime story. And so I wanted to play this game, but I really honestly couldn't figure out heads or tails of how you actually do that. Um, yeah, I kind of had a vague idea, but it wasn't really clear from those early uh, game sets what you're supposed to do. So I, I did eventually find some other kids who were playing that game, and we all played it completely incorrectly for a long time. But we had a great time, so it wasn't really wrong, right? But we clearly didn't totally understand how the rules are supposed to work but <laughs> as as we got more and more into it we kind of figured it out and we're like oh hey no like you can't really do that that's just a thing that the game master likes you know and uh so but we had a good time and uh i from a very early point was a dungeon master and liked to roll my own adventures create my own adventures create my own little rule sets uh, so by, you know, following our instinct instead of only what's on the printed page, you know, you become a game designer almost right away, right? You're you're just in that spirit of what's going to be fun to do. And that kind of gets you started. And then I used to get uh, little games from magazines like Dragon Magazine. Dungeon Magazine would print one-off games. I'd write little expansions to those on my own. Mm. And so, you know, for uh, 20 years or so, I was not a game designer in the professional sense, but... I was doing game design just for fun, uh, and that's something eventually when the OGL came out, I was super excited. That's a Wizards of the Coast open gaming license, and they basically invited everybody to write D&D material, and I was like, well, I always wanted to write D&D material. That's great. So, uh, And I thought the feat mechanic was really exciting, so I started making feats uh, and homebrewing those. And I found some people who had started something called the Fan Netbook Community Council. And they were basically, hey, let's publish fan-made content and put them into compiled tomes and make them available to everybody. So it's a little early internet days when, uh, you know, uh, you would just be on your own website. There was a social media and all that kind of thing. So uh, we began producing these books, and I eventually took over the feet. Uh, effort for the Feats book. And kind of all the other fan community council books went away. They got like one publish out. But the Feat one kept going and we we published it for about uh, five to seven years, I think. Uh, so quite a long time. And we had thousands of Feats in there. People would send them to us. I had a board of editors and we would edit the Feats, try to make them as close to Wizards of the Coast's professional standards for both the game design of Feats and the presentation and editing and all that. I mean, none of us were professional editors, but we did our best collectively to try and fill that role. And so, yeah, it just kind of went like that. And eventually when fourth edition came out, we kind of kind of gave up on the netbook of feats because feats weren't a big thing in fourth edition. Uh, it still exists out there, and I, I made a little fifth edition version of it, uh, which ended up being useful when we worked on Everyday Heroes. Uh, I worked with Kobold Press for a while doing feats for Pathfinder. We did the mm -hmm. uh, advanced feats series with Kobold Press really early in their days as a partnership with Wolfgang. And I was a professional software engineer for a long time, but uh, then about seven years ago, I kind of stopped being a software engineer and I became a writer, writing blogs, traveling around America, uh, going to Japan, writing about that. And uh, when I came back to the US during COVID, I found myself diagnosed with leukemia. And uh, while I had survived that, uh, hanging out with my good friend, Jeff Grubb, who's one of the people who worked on the original D20 Modern, uh, Dave, the owner of Evil Genius Games, which makes Everyday Heroes, uh, was calling around the lead designers from D20 Modern and talked to my friend Jeff. And 
asked if he wanted to make this game, and uh, Jeff wasn't available at the time, but I was hanging out in his basement and had just finished recovering <laughs> from chemotherapy, and so Dave said, hey, do you think you might want to make this game? I'm like, hell yeah, I want to make that game, right? Try to stop me. Um, and, uh, you know, so we talked a little bit. Uh, we went back and forth a little bit. He didn't like some of my initial ideas, but I'm like, hey, wait, I want to make the game that you want. His vision was a game that lets you play in movie worlds, right? So he wanted it to be easy because he plays Dungeons and Dragons. So wanted it to work like Dungeons and Dragons, but wanted it to feel like John Wick or Rambo or uh, Die Hard and to be uh, an exciting action movie with lots of gunfire and explosions and crazy over the top stuff. And I was like, yeah, uh, great. Now I understand your vision. I'm going to make you a game. Uh, and we got my co-designer, Goober, uh, also known as Chris Ramsley, and together we put together Everyday Heroes. And then uh, we knew from the beginning that there would be a lot of licensed properties, but we did not know what they would be. So we had to make a game that could be hard science fiction, or it could be uh, you know, a Western, or it could be a uh, police detective procedural. So we had to have a, a rule system that was very modular, and while the base game is like our present world in action movies, it needed to be able to expand in a lot of different directions uh, seamlessly and be able to suddenly feel like a totally different game. So uh, that was the the challenge that Goober and I set out to tackle, and uh, and that's kind of what got us where we are today. So, like, when you mentioned that you want to create these game worlds that feel like these action movies, and you've just mentioned that you got all these licensed kind of properties, you guys really threw everything at the wall. And I'm really impressed with some of the IPs you would get because as a guy, much like yourself, who would like to dabble and adapt different things and maybe drop this into D and D or in my case, it was a lot of world of darkness and shadow run to see you guys get something like the crow and Highlander, like two of my favorite movie series and television series that come out of the 1990s. Incredible. And then, a fairly recent thing with Kong Skull Island did not expect that. Like just the fact that you guys were able to capture the vibe of all these movie worlds and everything is quite special. And while I was reading particularly the Highlander book uh, last night uh, during a thunderstorm, so the quickening was happening <laughs> around me, um, just the fact that you have this really unique uh, combat system in there for dueling. And you mentioned how you used to design like feats and different things that didn't work with like other games, but you still wanted it to work in your game world. Go through your design process when making this modular world work with a another piece of licensed media. Cause the dueling system to Highlander, if this was straight D and D it'd be just combat roles resolving, but you have something different where like, you're like, I have this attribute. I want to do this. I want to do that. And I have to do this other system. So I would love to hear your thought process in designing that. Yeah, sure. So yeah, it's a unique system to create the feeling of a, an exciting one-on-one -on -one duel where you're really trying to get inside the head of your opponent, use their strengths and weaknesses against them while protecting your weaknesses and presenting your strengths, right? So that's the idea. When I approach game design, it's always from a perspective of what do I want play to feel like? What's the experience as a player and the experience as a game master that I'm trying to evoke the feeling and the the mental and emotional state that I want people to be in when they're playing the game. And uh, I guess that comes from, you know, 30 years of being a game master, because it's kind of what you do when you're a game master, too. So mm -hmm. I, I start with that. So I start with what is the feel of this game? What is it supposed to be like when you play? And then I design mechanics that will both, in a sense, mentally and emotionally stimulate you in that direction uh, while trying to keep them easy to comprehend as much as possible and quick to play. So the dueling system in Highlander was a challenge because epic duels is what Highlander is, the climax of Highlander is ultimately about, right? One-on-one -on -one sword duels. What does 5e not do very well, especially one-on-one -on -one sword duels? Um, it, it pretty much in you know straight D&D, &D, if you had a one-on-one -on -one fight between two melee characters, they will take turns whacking each other in the head and taking damage, right? And 
it can be cool because there's special moves they can do that help with the narration and help with the feel. They don't really help a lot with strategy because you're not going to do a lot of movement when you're doing that. Uh, just the way the rules are structured and uh, you're going to use your best move each turn probably. Uh, unless you're doing some disarms or something, there's not a whole lot of interaction. So I wanted a system that you could layer on top of combat. I didn't want to change combat because we tried to keep things compatible. So what happens if you have a one-on-one -on -one situation? And this could be PvP, it could be PvE, it could be two characters in the middle of a larger battle just focusing on one another like happens in the opening scene in Highlander. Um, so those players will do a little game amongst themselves at the beginning of the combat round. They pick one of six strategies based on the six ability scores in Everyday Heroes. Strength, Dexterity, Constitution, Intelligence, Wisdom, and Charisma. So they pick a strategy. Let's say I'm a really strong character and I pick, you know, punishing blows. I'm like, I'm raining down massive blows on my opponent. And the other guy's like, uh, he's a wise hero. And he's like, right, so I'm going to watch him carefully, look for an opening, and then take advantage of it, right? That's kind of the role play side of picking one of the six strategies. If you're feeling really lazy and you don't want to play the game, you could roll a dice, right? It's also set up so there's six, so you roll a d6 and pick your strategy that way. Then there's a little matrix table that has all the strategies on one side and then across the top. So you take the attackers, or well, there's not really attacker defender. You take the two player strategies, you look them up on the matrix, and it will reveal an ability score. Let's say strength versus dexterity ends up intelligence right? It's whoever has the best strategy in this situation is going to come out the victor. So the two players compare their intelligence scores. Whoever's the higher gets the edge. And the edge can be turned in in combat for all kinds of different abilities. You can turn a regular hit into a critical hit. You can take half damage from an attack. You can lower your opponent's defense. You can raise your defense. You can... Um, I try to remember the other two. Uh, anyway, there's a couple more things you can do. So there's about six different things that you can do in order to modify. Oh, yeah, give advantage to yourself or give disadvantage to your opponent. So you can choose which one of these is going to be most impactful, you think, based on the matchup of the two fighters' abilities. Like if you're up against somebody that does massive hits, then having uh, you know the damage might be good. If they have relatively low hit points, giving yourself a critical might be good, right? So you kind of want to decide what it is. And the matrix itself has a kind of strategy built into it, such that if you choose strength, there are two of the six outcomes in that column that will give you a strength comparison. So if you're just statistically trying to win and you have no idea what your opponent will do, then pick your best attribute score and you have a slightly higher random chance to, to nail it, right? But on the other hand, if your opponent knows that you're strong uh, and they counter-program you to avoid strength and they happen to be really charismatic and they're trying to program the table to get charisma, they might choose a stat that if you pick strength, they get charisma in the outcome. So there's a lot of guessing and second guessing as to what your opponents can do. And in playtesting, you know, because I built the system, I know it the best. Uh, I dueled all the other members of Evil Genius Games and, uh, you know, pretty consistently beat everybody because I figured out how to play the little game that I made. Um, and then once I would train them to play the game, that was a lot more even. So it really does add an element of skill and uh, thoughtfulness to the game. And as you're playing it, you know, first, you don't know your opponent's ability scores, so you don't necessarily know their weaknesses. But as you play the game, it reveals those, and you start to learn what you should or shouldn't do. Um, and it's a great tool for game masters, because they can program, in a sense, the bad guys to go, well, he's a strength guy, he just always chooses strength. And then that gives the players the opportunity to learn that strategy and counter-program and feel very clever, right, if you want to do it that way. Or if it's the big bad and you really want the epic showdown, the game master can try to play the game as cunning as possible. So it has a, a lot of opportunities for people to uh, explore that space. And it's an optional system. You don't have to use it. So it's just for using those epic moments when you want that feeling, right? Uh, if you're in a big grand melee, it's not really designed for that, right? It's it's one-on-one. -on -one. One of the things that I like about that system is it really captures and evokes the sense of that, that the tension that happens in the Highlander movies and TV shows, like it's really high stakes. When you enter a duel, there's a, not an uncommon chance that you're going to die. Um, yeah. so it's really, really captures the moment. And that's something that I really like about the everyday heroes from all the books that I've kind of breezed through. Whoever was in charge of the writing, not just from the mechanical standpoint, but from what I call fluff, 
there's such a deep love and reverence for the material that I find, I don't find too often in licensed RPGs. I've come across it a few times in the last couple of years with certain licensed IPs, but I find in the past, you could tell when someone was doing it for a paycheck and other times where they really feel the material is something that means something to them. And when I'm reading through these books, I very much get that vibe that you guys are trying to capture something that I think has been missing from the RPG space for a, a while. Anything that isn't D and D right. Like anybody can write dark sun or Ravenloft or whatever, but to really capture an RPG for Highlander, because like, again, from my group of friends, we've always wanted to play this. That's why we would import them into the world of darkness. And while they may not play well with the Camarilla, you know, now we have a system that works for that. We can tell those stories. And to go along with that, with a lot of your stuff, certain uh, properties, for example, when you talk about Escape from New York, which is another book you worked on, you do reference the events of Escape from L.A., but it's primarily based in the first movie, whereas the Highlander thing, you specifically say in some of the opening pages, this is only based on the 86 movie. Ignore everything else. If you want to include that, you have the option to, but it contradicts lore and continuity later on. Yeah, it really depends on the license holder when it comes to that, you know, what they, because we, we pass everything by the studios that we license from, right? And sometimes mm -hmm. they have a lot of notes coming back on things they want or don't want. And sometimes they pretty much just say, yeah, it looks great. Go for it. So like with Escape from New York, I had really wide latitude to build out that world, which was a great honor for me. I'm a big John Carpenter fan. And I like Escape from New York, but it doesn't really have a lot of lore, right? There's not much canonical information about Escape from New York. So I got to really uh, define that. I went and found the old out-of-print uh, book that the uh, was wow. written for the movie, right? And then read that and pulled little details from that. So I wanted to be consistent with it. I can't really reference it specifically because it's not something we have the license for, right? Um, mm -hmm. It was licensed to them, and, and so I don't know what the, the story is. But I, I certainly wanted everything that I wrote to be confluent with what's in that book. I read the comic books. Uh, they are a little out there for me. I think they take the, the setting in a direction that I didn't particularly care for. So I steered mm -hmm. around them. Um, but otherwise, I got to create a whole timeline from the decision of Nixon not to go through with Watergate leads us up to the blackout of the entire world at the end of Escape from L.A., right? So how do we get from A to B? And I got to write a whole timeline. And I was... Tickled Pink to have that opportunity to set down canonically the lore for the world of Escape from New York. That's an amazing privilege as a writer. It doesn't come along very often. And so, you know, and with all these books, you know, you kind of hit on it. Like, I try to become a super fan of the thing that I'm writing for, right? Like, I don't always have time, I'll be honest, to, to watch every piece of media. If I was to do Star Trek, for instance, like, I'd be <laughs> at it forever, right, if I hadn't seen it before. But I try to dive in. I read the wikis. I read the fan sites. I just go see what the fans are chatting about. I join bulletin boards and fan clubs for these, these properties. And I just try to get a vibe. What excites people about the property? What do they love about it? Now, some of them, like Highlander, you know, I know Highlander super well, seen all that stuff already. Um, my mother-in-law used to call me the Highlander because I, I had long <laughs> hair, you know. And so, like, that one I'm already a super fan of. But some of the others, like Rambo, I hadn't seen before. But I dived in, uh, you know, whole hog and really put myself in a frame of what do people love about it? What are the essential elements? What makes it unique? Why is it something people remember? And bring that into the game, right? The game has to have the feeling that is what people love about the property. And I have to love it, right? Even if there's something I don't like about it, like, let's say you know, the Highlander sequels, right? Uh, I don't have to love them. Fortunately, they were like, the licensor was like, yeah, don't include anything except the movie, right? Just the movie. <laughs> now I was a little disappointed because I like some stuff from the TV show, but they were like, no, yeah, same. stick to the movie. And so I left the door open for all the other stuff that's out there. I didn't want to contradict things in the TV show 
Um, the, the second and third movie are a whole other story. They're kind of a hopeless mess. But I even left the door open for the elements from them that are kind of interesting, like the little, little bit more mystical side of immortals, because clearly they're magical, right? So maybe they can have mystical powers. That's fine. We We don't say they do, but we... Anything in the first movie that could possibly lead in that direction, I emphasize a little bit so that game masters have a lot of open doors to, to use their creativity and make that Highlander world kind of their own world, right? So, yeah, we just become a super fan and dive in and uh, go crazy with it. Yeah, that's the... Uh, and- I've lost my train of thought, so I turn it back to you. <laughs> but yeah, like it, it's incredible just to see, like I said, just the depth of l- research and lore that you guys are willing to include. And obviously, like you just mentioned, you have to run it by the studios. And it seems like you were given a fairly wide latitude to c- create something like this. So when you were working on any of these properties, did you have any memorable encounters? Like, for example, did you talk to John Carpenter, perhaps? <laughs> no, you know, it, it's too bad because the most uh, the most encounter like that, I cannot talk about, unfortunately. Oh. Yeah, so not all licenses go exactly as you plan them to. Uh, so mm-hmm. it is a it adds expense and it adds a challenge level to designing games, I will say. So if people want to get mm-hmm. into it, uh, it definitely isn't an easy road. Uh, sometimes it's wonderful and it's really rewarding and it's great to have that creativity base. But there was a, a famous director I, we did get to spend a lot of time talking to and they were cool. wonderful and uh, super creative and they were amazing meetings and it's wonderful. But uh, the license, we are unable to bring it to players as of yet. So um, still, there's still some possibility for it, but it's not looking great. Uh, we roll a whole game, and uh, we might not get to, to do anything with it. But it was a wonderful experience up until they said, no, sorry, we don't want you to do it anymore. Um, but up till that point, it was great. And we don't normally get to talk to the directors, but we get to talk to the license holders in the studios. And they have some really fine people that guard the lore for their world. And we try to be super respectful of them. We had some great conversations with the Highlander people because, like, at uh, I wrote that the immortals can sense when they're on holy ground because in a game world, it's important if you're not supposed to fight on it, that you know that you are on it. Right. And it's not like in the real world, holy ground comes with some uh, sign markers so that you know that you're there. Right. There's no universally agreed idea. And in the game, we write, well, that's up to the game master to decide what is or isn't holy ground. So the immortals need a way to sense it so that they know not to fight on it. And there also needs to be a little bit of an enforcement mechanism because most of the rules in the immortal game enforce themselves like one-on-one duels you don't want other people to take your quarry's head and gain the benefit of the quickening and when you're taking the quickening you're incredibly vulnerable so another immortal could come and kill you so there's reasons why immortals want a duel like that however uh the one rule that there's not a lot of real world incentive is the holy ground rule other than reciprocity but if you're a dishonorable immortal why not sneak into the abbey and take out your opponent right so we actually have a little bit of a mechanic that that prevents that or makes it very difficult, let's say. I never like to completely control the players, but we do like to incentivize them in the right direction. Um, So I had to write to the studio and I said, look, they said, well, that's not canonical. I was like, I know it's not canonical, but if we don't have this, people will A, accidentally kill each other on holy ground and B, do it on purpose, whatever it's convenient to them. And then it won't feel like Highlander, will it? So in a movie, it's very easy to just write the characters so they don't do the things you don't want them to do but in a role-playing game you don't have that control so uh, they looked at my logic and they agreed with it Uh, i offered them that i would write that this specific rule is non-canonical in the book uh, and they were like that would be wonderful thank you so much and so that's what we did Um, so any place we may venture from canon we will call it out Um, because sometimes to make something feel more like the thing in a different media, you have to break the rules a little bit because the the needs of the media are different. All right. So I guess as, as we begin to uh, close out this discussion, I, I guess as someone who just began in the RPG industry literally within the last couple of months, um, I know my journey here was very much... I'm going to take a blind email and take a shot in the dark and see what happens. But I also had my advantage of being in the media first. That's how I got my proverbial foot in the door. 
Um, what would you say to people who want to work in this creative space? Because there's so many resources, like there's drive through RPG, there's the dungeon masters guild, there's like fan sites, how like kind of you started out. How do people get involved in this creative industry? Cause it seems like right now role playing hasn't been this hot in like decades. Yeah, it does seem to be pretty good uh, right now. You know, COVID kind of gave everybody uh, a little bit of a boost there in a way in the tabletop RPG space, which seems a little contrary because you can't get together. But people are, a lot of people read books and don't play them, right? So, um, and the industry is really driven more by people uh, buying books than anything else, right? So uh, people are buying a lot of books and they were, uh, that helps expand everything. So I have two pieces of advice. Like these are two main things and, and they're not like, particularly insightful, right? It's the same thing almost <laughs> anybody in the industry will tell you. Uh, okay, maybe three things, three things. All right, the first one is uh, write stuff. Just make things, make games, be creative, do it for yourself, do it for your friends. And you need that practice, right? Because if you do want to be in the industry, you need to write at a professional level or create at a professional level or draw, you know, what, whatever input, it, creative input that you're putting in, you want to practice that a lot so that your skills will continue to rise. Uh, I had my editor say, boy, Sig, your writing has really improved in the last year. And I'm like, yeah, writing 300,000 words will do that to you, right? Like, you know, <laughs> just the act of doing the creation <clears throat> will make you better and better. And the more you do it, the better you will be. Whether you feel like you're getting better or not, that's not for you to judge, uh, really. You, people are terrible judges of their own work. Um, but uh, just keep working at it and you will get better and read other people's stuff and expose yourself, right? So that's step one, do a lot of work. Uh, step two is uh, ask, right? Tell people that you want to work for them. Tell them you're excited to work on the project that you're, you're applying to work on. You know, I love your games. I love this game. I've made 17 character classes for it. I'm just obsessed with it. Uh, here's an example of the writing because you've been doing all that writing uh, for you to look at. Uh, I would really love to do it and do it as many places as you have the gumption. You'll get, you'll hear no a lot because a lot of companies, they have as many writers as they need, right? Otherwise they wouldn't be making any books, but uh, people come and go all the time. And so they may be in need or maybe there's a tight deadline and somebody got sick, that's your chance, right? So when you're in that early stage, especially uh, ask a lot and say yes, whenever you have the opportunity to, so long as you feel the compensation is fair and the deal is, is good. Uh, and that you can do what's asked of you, but try to say yes a lot, especially early on until you kind of have an established reputation. And then you have so many requests that you can start to say no, right? But uh, be very open and be very forward in telling people you're interested. Don't badger people forever. No one wants that, right? But do reach out to inquiries to many different companies and different people. Third one is uh, socialize in your gaming world. Uh, and try to meet people who own gaming companies or who are game designers, game writers, uh, make friends with them. Uh, you know, that's, I have friends with a lot of people from the old, old TSR and Wizards of the Coast, right? So Jeff Grubb and Wolfgang Bauer and some of these people, they're my gaming buddies. And I met them playing Legend of the Five Rings and playing Dungeons and Dragons. So you meet people, you play games with them, if they're in the industry, play more games with them, get to know them, try to be a nice person, uh, and then at some point uh, say, hey, you know, I also write, do you know of any opportunities? And uh, because if they recommend you, if somebody well-known recommends you to somebody else, you get jobs. And, I mean, that's how I got this job, right, is Jeff Grubb, uh, who's well-known in the business, recommended me to somebody else, and so I got that opportunity. First time I've written my own full you know, marquee role-playing game and movie license supplements and all that stuff. But in a way, you know, I spent 30 years getting ready for that job. So when the opportunity was there, boom, I was, I was on top of it. Right. So, yeah. And, and, and you I... know, from my prior experience, you just, uh, mm -hmm. you start, once you start to work in the biz, you will get more people coming to you because you're starting to know more people who have offers for you. And uh, if you want to really be full time in it, keep saying yes, keep taking the work and eventually you'll have a lot of work. Once you start saying no to people, then the offers dry off because they're like, oh, he's not interested in work, right? And then they go and ask other people. So yeah, so there's that. I was gonna say, um, I, I, I guess one question I've never asked anybody uh, like yourself 
you've just given a lot of really solid advice. Is there any one thing people should not do? Yeah, I mean, it, and it's kind of simple too. Don't be a jerk, right? Like, don't be difficult to work with. Don't uh, put off your work. You know, turn things in on time. I guess that's a positive thing. But yeah, just be kind and loving and supportive of other people. Uh, that may seem like strange advice. Uh, I don't know, but life goes a lot better when you are focused on making other people's lives better. So be helpful and be interested in what other people are doing. Genuinely be interested in their work and their success. And if you do that consistently, uh, you will be well regarded. And that's very important. I, I got to say, this has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much, Siegfried. So if people want to find out more information about you and Evil Genius Games, where would they have to go? Right. So you want to go to evilgeniusgames.com. And that's our website. And you can see the products we have. You can buy stuff if you're interested in it. Download free downloads. We got lots of those, too. And uh, yeah, just see all the stuff going on. Now, our website is a little under construction at the moment. We're transitioning from Evil Genius Gaming to Evil Genius Games. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's a few uh, nuts and bolts missing on that. But uh, it should be, hopefully by the time people hear it, it's all wonderful and everything's smooth as butter. So you can go there. You, know, you can find us on all the social medias. I tend to be, there's a Facebook fan group. Uh, that's uh, for Evil Genius Games and for Everyday Heroes. That's very popular. And I interact there daily with the fans, and uh, they are wonderful fans. I can't tell you how exciting it is to have fans of a game that I've made. It's amazing because they just compile the creativity. So I try to help them out at every opportunity. Um, we're also on our Discord. Uh, you want to go to the website, look for the, um, you know, how to hang out with us. And so come to our Discord. We recruit playtesters from there. You get opportunities to check things out. You can ask me questions. You can ask Goober questions. Ask anybody questions. And we're usually just hanging out on this card. It's where we do our business because we're kind of an international or not. Yeah, an international company, actually. We've got people all over the world working for us. Um, so you can hang out there. We'll chat with you. Those are the best ways to connect with Evil Genius Games. Uh, watch for our Kickstarter. Uh, we're also going to be doing one on Backer Kit soon because Kickstarter kind of limits how many you can do, and we've got some more going on, so we can do it on Backer Kit and on GameFound. So all over the place. Me personally, I have a bunch of websites, but the gaming one is uh, just sigtrent.com, uh, S-I-G-T-R-E-N-T. I don't think I've posted a new blog post up there in a while, but you can see some of my work. I've got a little store there where you can get free games from me, or you can get some of my older games that I've got a deal to, to make available on my site. Uh, you can check out my blog entries. There's also SiegfriedTrent.com, which is just my name. And that's like a personal blog. I've got all kinds of essays and things. So there's a lot of me on the internet because I am sort of a prolific writer and I like to share that stuff. So. Um, yeah, just Google Siegfried Trent and you'll find lots of me. I got to say, this has been an absolute pleasure. I know one game I'm really looking forward to is one of my favorite 1990s movies, and that's Universal Soldier. I'm a Jean-Claude Van Damme mark, so uh, that's <laughs> something I'm so going to be talking about here on this podcast in the future. Again, thank you for spending part of your afternoon with me. This has been awesome. And I know the listeners of This Week in Geek are very thankful as well. Right. A great pleasure for me. Thank you so much for having me on the show. All right, guys. So once again, that was Siegfried Trent. Please check out his stuff. We're going to be talking about Everyday Heroes uh, leading up through now until the Holiday Gift Guide, which will be coming out uh, around early December. But if you don't want to wait to get physical books, you can order these books via PDF and get the digital right now. There's a lot of really cool stuff here. If you are a fan of any of these IPs, there's some awesome things there. Obviously, uh, you can adapt these worlds to whatever you want. So if you want to 
do John Wick, if you want to do The Matrix, if you want to do pretty much anything, you now have a toolkit that works. It's a world you understand. It's a rule system you understand. And these guys have somehow managed to tweak it to make it just a little bit better. So, guys, that's going to do it for me here on ThisWeekInGeek.net. I will be back with Alex, Aaron, JT, and Ken as we continue moving on through uh, pretty much the end of the year. we got a lot of stuff to cover. we got um, our holiday show we'll be doing with James Rolfe, uh, otherwise known as the Angry Video Game Nerd. We're going to be talking about the Hammer Horror movies for Halloween this year, but we're also going to be talking about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre with myself and probably Aaron, maybe, Alex. I'm not 100% sure, but we got a lot of good stuff coming up on the podcast, plus Broketober's coming, so... So many video games, so little time, only so much G feel you can take before you probably die. So anyway, guys, uh, for This Week in Geek, I've been Mike the Birdman saying be excellent to each other, and we'll catch you guys again next time right here on ThisWeekInGeek.net. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Thanks for listening to this episode of This Week in Geek. Hungry for more? Check out our website at thisweekingeek.net. You can subscribe to the podcast, browse our Twitter and Instagram, and leave your thoughts on today's topics. If you'd like to give us some feedback, send us an email at feedback at thisweekingeek.net. Tune in next time, and remember, lower your shields and surrender your listenership. We would be honored if you would join us. Thank you for your cooperation. Good night.